Um, and we have some entertainment for you um, during the break here. Leah Brady um, is with the Great Basin uh, Native Basket Weavers Association. She's a member of the Western Shoshone Tribe and the current chairperson um, of the Great Basin Native Basket Weavers Association. She specializes in Western Shoshone open and closed twine baskets, contemporary red willow pine needle, gourds and other commercial baskets, um, commercial material baskets. She's a retired public school teacher, thank you for your service, and former UNISERVE director for the Nevada State Education Association. She's one of the authors of Celebrating Nevada Indians, a teaching curriculum. She's traveled throughout Nevada, California, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and Arizona, promoting the GBN, <clears throat> GBNBA organization, performing basketry and cultural presentations, and demonstrating her willow work. She was selected for the 2006 Carriers of Culture Smithsonian Folklife Festival, representing the Western Shoshone tribe from the Great Basin area. She's been recognized as a master weaver for the Nevada Folk Arts Program. She teaches weaving classes at the Great Basin College in Elko, Nevada. Um, and she has also demonstrated basketry at the California National Historic Trail Interpretive Center um, for the past uh, 11 years in Elko, Nevada. We are so honored and delighted, Leah, that you could join us today um, and provide us a live cultural activity um, during our break time. Some people are gonna take a break, but I'm sure some people will um, enjoy watching you, since, especially since you have been so used to doing um, this via Zoom. And I will turn it over to you, Leah. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Leah Brady and I'm um, a white knife Shoshone from Elko, Nevada. And I'm gonna share with you the baskets. I'm chair of the Great Basin Native Basket Weavers and our motto for our organization is keeping the baskets alive for another thousand years. And that's one of the things that we really stress is teaching young people so that we keep continuing with what we're doing uh, so that they'll learn about the baskets. And I'm going to show you the baskets in my collection, but also the ones that I do because um, our baskets are willow, but I also do contemporary baskets also. Um, and we uh, actually, uh, we started our life in a basket. And as you can see on the wall here, and I'll have to, angle it so it may be moving for a while but the basket in on the top row in the center is what is called our newborn basket because we didn't prepare anything until the baby was born so that basket could be made in a day and then the baby was put into that basket until the ones on the side of it which are our traditional baskets uh, they were took about a month to make and so they would start on those baskets. And so uh, depending on the size, it can go up to 40 inches. And our babies love to stay in the cradles. Um, in fact, some of them try crawling in after they're taken out. But by the time they're start, starting to walk, they would be taken out of the cradle. I also have other cradles here uh, the one with the beaded rose on is Northern Paiute. The one next to it with the hoop across it, uh, oh, and the Northern Paiute one was made by Tammy Henry. Uh, Everett Pickovit made the Southern Paiute Shemueve basket there. Uh, that's the second one from the right. And then I made the one with the white canvas. And canvas, the ones on the top are covered in buckskin, but once the immigrants came into our area, we were able to get a hold of canvas. So our people have been covering the baskets for more than a hundred years um, with canvas and it, it's easier to clean, but we still do make the traditional buckskin baskets. So that's my little cradle there. And then next to my cradle, um, 
the fourth one over is a washer basket. So the washer on the western side of Nevada. Uh, the Great Basin covers all the area around Nevada and the surrounding states. So uh, the go shoot, which is the one with the little blue design on it, that is a go shoot basket. And the go shoot are, are Shoshone people that have uh, intermarried with the Ute tribes also. And then we have the two baskets on the side, the, on the top row. The one with the zigzag design on it is from the Lone Pine area from California, made by a Charlotte Backage. And um, you can see they do uh, like the washer basket, which is the fourth one from the right. And that was the washer basket was made by Sue Coleman and the Lone Pine Basket was made by uh, Charlotte Backage. And then my mother also made the last one with the beaded uh, blue design on it. That's another basket and I did her shades for her. Uh, my mother also is the one that taught me how to do the baskets on the top row, the ones that are covered with buckskin and then I did the newborn. And I, I learned from my elders but I was going to college when I was in my 20s and I had carpal tunnel and couldn't beat anymore. So we, my mother found a washer lady and her name was Elaine Christensen. And Elaine taught me how to split the willows and, and clean my thread and everything so that I could learn to do baskets because I was living in the Reno area, which is 300 miles from home. So for me, um, I share because without these people, I wouldn't have learned how to do baskets either. And so I really appreciate all the teachers that I've had. Um, and I'm not sure that I mentioned the name of the person that did the go shoot basket with the blue design. That was um, Bernice Still, and she has passed away. Um, but I, I do, all of our baskets, the big baskets you see that are the cone-shaped baskets are our burden baskets. And then we have on the table from the red baskets over, we have a bird trap and I'll lift all of these up. We have a bird trap, we have storage containers, seed beaters, uh, seed containers, uh, hats, we have winnowing trays, and bowls, and water jugs, and then I have my little friend who I made that shows um, her, uh, the young mother with her newborn baby carrying her burden basket on her back, and her berry basket on her wrist and her winnowing trays down on the ground by her. But we do a lot of different things and our main material is willow. And we even made our houses out of willow. So our uh, frame for our house is how many people make the sweat houses and, and we, made ours with panels and and created our walls that went around the house and and that's how, how we lived in the state we covered with whatever materials were available if you were near areas with tule then you would cover your house with tule if you were near sagebrush you would have sagebrush so it depended on what material you had available because as you know the great basin is one big desert bowl and we don't have a lot of water so not every area has willows so we learned to use with whatever materials that we had in order to make our homes also but willow was probably uh, the most important thing that we had not only as a, a basket weaving and for materials but we also made tea. It was a medicinal tea that we used for our, um, our willow, from our willow. 
And one of the things about Willow, and I'll, I'll say this before I go on, is that it's getting harder and harder because of the environment changing. Um, we just had a snowstorm, and this is only really our second storm of the year, and we're almost towards the end of winter. And um, so last year we had the same type of weather. And when that happens, we can't gather the willow. And what we gather is we actually gather what's considered the saplings. So your saplings are actually the new growth of the willow. And so, and, and this is small, you could probably see that better. And you can see on here, the buds have closed. So when the plant is dormant, that's when we gather the willow. And what that does is it allows us to make our thread because our baskets, the entire basket is made out of willow. So as you look at that large basket that's standing here, that whole thing is willow with the exception of the straps and decorations. But we take the willow and we split it into three parts. And with those three parts, we take one and we put it in our mouth and we're holding it tight against our body, but we're pulling away from the, from our, ourselves. And at the same time, I'm pulling all three of them apart. And then I just slowly work my way down. Kind of hard to do in the air, but I'm trying to keep it in the camera <laughs> space here. Let me get this here. Didn't quite work I'm keeping it up there, but. So after we take and we split the willow, you can see that there's a core that's inside the willow. And I've kept them inside to keep them a little warm. So it's kind of dry, but usually we let the core dry. And so what I'm doing is I'm, I gotta find the camera. I'm taking the core out of it. Because what we want is, we want a thread. That we're going to weave with. And the thread needs to be paper thin. And that's what we're going to use to weave with. So as we look at these baskets, and I'll turn towards the willow ones here. That big basket took over 300 rods, just the sticks that I'm weaving around. And if you add another three to 400 threads to do the stitching on the rows going across it, it takes an enormous amount of willows to do that. The tray that's standing in the background there, um, the tray that's back here, that took over 300 willows to make that basket. Uh, this basket here, this the seed container, 
takes about 150 little rods. And when we're talking little rods, we're talking uh, very small ones. Uh, this is a rod. So when I say rod, that's what the rod is. And it takes about 150 to make just the bottom part. And then if you count the threads, you're probably over 200 threads. So for each willow, I can get three threads out of it. So when we're looking at our baskets, in order to even make a roll like that, this is probably about a good, a good two to three hour job to get the willow to this point. Because after you take and you take the core out, then you have to clean it. And I can't do it at this time. It's a, it's, it's a period of time that you have to take and you have to let the, the skin dry. So I'm taking and I'm running it through here, hoping it'll come off, but it probably won't because it's still too wet. If I peel it off, it'll peel off a little harder. It'll peel off, but as you can see, it, it breaks real easy. So I have to wait in order for it to come off. And there's still another layer on here, which is why we don't peel it off until they're, they're dry. It's a cambium layer. And that's the property that has the aspirin properties in it, the salix. And that's what we make the tea with. But we, we get it dry and when it's dry, once we get to this point, then we can actually peel it off. So what baskets do we have here? And one of the first uh, ones I was gonna talk about was the, I think I have the burden back here and make my little notes. Because our baskets, not only were they important for um, our home and our, our babies, but we gathered with them. This basket here is called the burden basket. It's a wosa, and the wosa was used to collect our pine nuts. So if you look at the tray there, right here, I've got the pine cones on there and then the pine nuts on the basket. They would go up into the Pinet Hills. They would stay up there for more than a month collecting because they did say it took more than a thousand pounds to keep a, or feed a family of four during the winter time. So I know our family's gone out and we've collected all day. And if we were lucky, we had 15 pounds. So it took a lot of work and there was four of us doing that just to get the 15 pounds. <laughs> but uh, they would put all of the cones in here, then take them back to camp. And then they were able to process them there. The burden was also our suitcase. So we were able to, um, when it was time to leave and travel to our next gathering spot, we would put all our belongings in there and it had to fit in there to carry, just like the doll had her burden on her back. We had to be able to carry it. And so we didn't carry much and things like grinding stones were left wherever that gathering was, if it was important for that gathering. But usually they were around the Pinet Hills because that's where they were needed the most. Um, and then we had another basket and that's our seed beater here. And this one here is a kind of, it looks like a little paddle. And we called it a seed beater and I don't recall a name for it, but 
uh, that was used to beat the seeds off the bushes. A lot of people didn't know a lot of our, our plants had seeds on it. And that's how we gathered them. Even the rice grass that grows uh, along the roads and all over the place in the sandy areas. Um, it's so small, it's probably not even an eighth of an inch big, but they use that, that to beat it off of the bushes so they could gather it. After they took the, the pinets back to camp, then you have the trays. And this is a small tray compared to what the normal size would be. But they would actually take the beaters, they would hit the cones, knock them into the trays. They would fill that tray up with pinets. Then they would take the hot embers from the fire and they would put the embers on top of the, the pinets and then they would cook the pinets using the tray, moving it, adding more red hot embers, and then they would take it off of there, put it on the grinding stones, and then they would uh, crush the shell. They would take the nut meats, put them back onto the, the tray, and then they would take hot embers again, and then they would um, cook the, parch the nut meat. And then they would take it and put it on the grinding stones and they would grind it into a flour uh, texture. And then they would store it. So I call this my seed basket because this basket is, many people think it's a water jug here, but it's actually a seed container because it's not pitched. We would pitch, as you could see from this large water jug, we would pitch that. So my basket here isn't pitched, but I keep my pinets inside there. And as you can see, it rolls around. It doesn't completely spill. It usually is the other way, but I don't want to have to get up and get that. Um, but we would keep the seeds in there or we would store, if it's really uh, fine, we would store the powder in that container also, but we'd probably pitch it at that point to keep it from leaking out because the, wa the water would stay in the jug if it was pitched for a long period of time. So the seed container is just like um, the water jug, of course, and the water jug is living in a desert. You can see that we would have to spend a lot of time um, bringing our own water. So these jugs were made similar. This is a flat bottom, so it could be stored in the house. Uh, the pointy bottoms, they usually carried on the road with them. It was usually a, a smaller container. But the pitch would, would keep the, the basket from le leaking. And, and what they did is they collected the pitch from the pinion pine and they would, while they were out gathering, and then they would um, put it in and melt it inside the, the, the basket itself using the hot rocks. They would put it in there, the hot embers, and, and melt that pitch so it coated the inside so that it didn't leak. And then the basket next to it is another basket that's what we consider a cooking basket. And that basket was also how they made their soups. So with that powder that they made, they took that powder and during the winter, they would be able to put that powder into their gravy, soups and gravies. They did eat the pine nuts whole, but usually not much because uh, they had to feed more people. So with the gravy, they could feed more people using that. And they would actually take and they would cook in the basket. So they would put water in there, add their ingredients, and then next to a hot fire, they would heat the rocks and they would uh, drop the rocks into the basket and 
they would keep taking them in and out until the water boiled. And it usually took about 10 minutes to do that. It wasn't a long process. And that's how they cooked their soups and gravies that they were able to have. I have some other baskets that my grandmother made on my father's side that are inside the glass container there. And you can see there's a small cup there. And they even made cups. Uh, there's a seed beater in there that's a closed one uh, and another bowl in there. And those, once you put the water in there, they could probably last for not more than an hour before they started leaking. But the willow expands when you put the water in. So it also helps with holding the water. So that little bowl is what they would put their soups and gravies in. And of course, next to that is a hat with the feathers on top. That's my willow hat because we wore hats just like my doll had her hat on. Um, the hat protected our heads um, in the winter time, or not in the winter time, when we were wearing uh, uh, or carrying things, uh, but it also protected from the sun. So we also wore hats and it's breathable. So they were able to, to wear it during the hot, hot sun times. Now, um, let's see what I missed here. What the hell? Oh, we were gonna talk about the other things because, because it's a, a seasonal gathering. Um, some of the baskets you see here, uh, like this is a basket I'm working on. This is tule. And tule is a marsh plant. And so we have tule in the, what I say, the dive boat name, the, so I guess the scientific name is bulrush. It's got the brown nuts that are at the top of the plant. And we gather that in summertime, depending on the size that we want. So we have different sizes. So this is kind of a medium size and you can see it's a pretty tall plant here that we used. But I take and I, I make my bundles and sizes so that we can make um, little baskets. These are, this is a smaller version of a, a tule basket and an egg basket. And so we made bigger ones. So when you were by the marshes, you were able to uh, collect the duck eggs because we live in a migratory pathway. And so on both sides of the state. And so the birds that come into this area, they were able to, to gather the eggs from those laying eggs. We also had a basket that we trapped the birds in because we didn't have a lot of deer and elk and buffalo to eat. So we had to rely upon what we found and birds was one. So this is a small trap that we just had a class on and we would put the feed inside and the little birds would come and, and then we would roast them. A lot of our, our baskets, um, I think I showed you the tray. I don't do many coil baskets, but um, here's a little example of a little coil basket I've done. Um, and this is my doll's cooking pot. So I made her a little bowl for her food. But um, because I have carpal tunnel, it's hard for me to do some coiling, but I do do it. Um, the pin I'm wearing is with pine needle. Uh, it's a pine needle and then it's beaded around the pine needle basket. And I use pine needle to make bowls. I weave around things. So this is a start that I've been working on that I'm work, working using pine needle. And then in the background, I also do gourds because our basket weaving is seasonal. 
And once we use our thread, that's it. So I do the other baskets. I've got the, the pine needle on the gourds. I use reed. This is a pine needle. These are reeds that I'm doing with the gourds. I also do miniatures of our baskets using reed. Um, and uh, this is an abalone shell that I did covered with a sedge. And we do that because during the rest of the year, you know, once my willow is gone and I don't have enough to work baskets and I do other weaving using other materials. That way my hands don't get bad on me. And I believe we're out of time. Thank you, Leah. I was just pulling up uh, your website here to put the link in the chat. The association, I should say. If you have, if you have one that's separate from that, feel free to put that in there too. Yes. Um, thank you so much oh, yeah. for this activity demonstration. I can see by the comments that um, it is by far one of the highlights of the day. And we're so grateful for you sharing your, your time and your talents with us. I can see that you've, you've taught many people through uh, many different formats um, doing this for a long time. Um, I know that I was riveted. Um, I managed to squeeze in a couple minute break, but <laughs> I didn't want to leave myself. So um, yeah, thank you. Um, I hope that you got the conference gift package that we sent well, to you. Thank you for inviting. Yeah, yep, our pleasure. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Leah. No, okay. Okay. So...